On the eve of the American Revolution, Samuel Johnson, the English essayist and Tory, asked, why is it that the loudest yelps for liberty are heard from drivers of Negroes? Good question. It's still being asked today. Not far from here is the White House. And the first president of this land, George Washington, George was a slave owner. George was a slave owner. Slavery seems like the original sin of the American creation. What did the Founding Fathers think about it? What did they propose to do about it? At the start of the American Revolution, every one of the original 13 states had slaves. There were no slaves in Vermont, but it would not become a state until 1791. But in 1776, the Continental Congress laid down a momentous marker. All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these is liberty. Two realities. A system of chattel slavery that existed everywhere and a declaration of libertarian principle that had been endorsed by everyone. The founders tried to bridge this gap in three ways. One was to eliminate slavery in their home states. States that had few slaves, like Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, abolished slavery before the Revolutionary War was over. Others took more time. In the mid-18th century, one-fifth of the population of New York City was slaves, and slaves lived on farms from Long Island to the Hudson Valley. In James Fenimore Cooper's autobiographical novel, The Pioneers, the upstate landowner, Marmaduke Temple, has a slave coachman named Agamemnon. The book also describes a free black man, Brahm Freeborn, who makes extra money at Christmas holding turkey shoots. In 1785, a group of 32 New Yorkers formed an organization to lobby for change. They included Governor George Clinton, former congressman and diplomat John Jay, and a young veteran and lawyer, Alexander Hamilton. Jay was made the first president. The Manumission Society passed an eloquent statement of principle. The benevolent Father and Creator of men has given to them all an equal right to life, liberty, and property. But unlike the signers of the Declaration, they committed themselves to doing something about it. It is our duty to endeavor by lawful ways and means to enable slaves to share equally with us in civil and religious liberty. In 1799, when Jay was governor, the state passed a law freeing all slave children born after July 4th that year. In 1817, New York passed a second law, freeing all slaves, by July 4th, 1827. By then, Hamilton and Clinton were dead. Jay was 82 years old. Better late than never. Other founders tried to eliminate slavery in their own lives. George Wythe was the first law professor in the United States. His students included Thomas Jefferson, James Monroe, and John Marshall. He signed the Declaration of Independence. A purer character, said Jefferson, has never lived. One way Wythe showed his character was by freeing his slaves. In 1787, after his second wife died, Wythe freed his cook, Lydia, and her husband, Ben. He also freed two other slaves, Polly and Charles. He taught two black boys to write to show, as one judge's wife put it, that there was no natural inferiority of intellect in the Negro. One of those students was a free black boy named Michael Brown. In 1806, it ended badly. With age 80, and Brown suddenly fell ill. 
Lydia the cook said that one of Wythe's grandnephews, who was one of his heirs, had put poison in the breakfast coffee. Wythe lived long enough to disinherit him, but because blacks could not testify against whites in court, the grandnephew walked. Wythe and Brown both died. Wythe could save slaves from bondage, but he couldn't save himself. And some founders reconciled slavery in the Declaration of Independence by ignoring the Declaration. Charles Pinckney was a South Carolina patriot who signed the Constitution. In 1800, he managed Jefferson's presidential campaign in South Carolina, winning him the state and the election. In 1818, Missouri applied to be the first state in the American West. Pinckney, age 61, ran for Congress to make sure it would be a slave state. The country had already split north and south into pro- and anti-slavery sections. Henry Clay, Speaker of the House, devised a batch of compromises to admit Missouri with slavery, but give slavery's opponents something, too. Pinckney opposed giving slavery's opponents anything. In one speech in February 1821, he explained why. The African man is still as savage as ever, as unchanged as the lion or tiger which roams in the same forests as himself. They must have been created with less intellectual powers than the whites, and were most probably intended to serve them. Pinckney liked slavery just fine because he believed all men were created unequal. Many Americans agreed. The same month Pinckney spoke, an older founder, John Adams, wrote another, Thomas Jefferson, about a vision. I have seen slavery hanging over this country like a black cloud for half a century. I might say I had seen armies of Negroes marching and countermarching in the air, shining in armor. In forty years there would be armies of whites and blacks marching on the ground. The founders had laid down a principle, and some of them tried to make it real. Not enough of them.